Welcome to Making Stuff with Chris Dayhut. In this video, we're going to be talking about rotary switches. They're not very popular today, but nonetheless, they have good applications. So we're going to take a look at how to interface them with the Raspberry Pi Pico using MicroPython. We'll take a look at a few examples of them, their applications, we'll review a data sheet to understand the important attributes about a switch, We'll take a look at a Fritzing wiring diagram that shows us how simple it is to connect them to the Raspberry Pi Pico. And finally, we'll look at some MicroPython code to handle them. Rotary switches have been around for a long time. Their history dates back to around the early 1930s, at least that's the earliest reference I could find on them. Uh, so they go back, and because of that vintage or that time frame, you can imagine what they would have been used for at that time is turning a power device on or off, just like a toggle switch or rocker switches, etc. However, we can use them in our electronic projects today as a substitute for a toggle or a uh, latching switch, a push button switch that's latching, um, you know, those types of things can give your, your object or your project a, a different look and feel. So let's take a look at a larger industrial one here on the bench. As you can see, this is quite an elaborate mechanism, but this is for uh, industrial applications, so it's got very large contacts. It can handle 18-gauge wire via screw terminals on it. Uh, it. It's all around heavy duty, more so than you'd see on typical small electronic projects today. Uh, but the actuation is, as you imagine, it's a rotary switch. On, off. Very easy to identify uh, what state the switch is on. Usually there's a tag above saying off and on, etc. Now this is only a two position, and it isn't perhaps the best example of rotary switches. Uh, many rotary switches can actually keep rotating around almost 360, and they'll have detents at each point. And that allows you to use one rotary switch to go from common to select any one of up to 12 or 16 different devices. They can be very elaborate uh, devices, but that style of switch, like I say, they're fading into the into the history books and their application is getting less and less. I do believe I've got a few photographs of industrial applications of the multi-position rotary switches and if so we'll uh, put those up on the screen in editing for you. Another rotary switch uh, that uh, I use uh, at times, uh, not often for projects for my own stuff, but uh, for other projects where you want some security so somebody can't just actuate something. And this is a basic key switch. You'll see these. Uh, you can purchase them in many different sizes, etc. Uh, generally, they're not super secure. This happens to actually be a very nice quality one. Uh, but, as you can imagine, it's rotary. Turn the key, it, turning a device on, turn the key back, and you're turning the device off. And, of course, that can be setting a state in our software, uh, just like the toggle switches, dip switches, and all these other devices that behave similarly. So rotary switches would be a go-to switch where you want something that looks a little different, uh, just to spice up your project a little bit. Uh, don't discount them. They're very handy, they're very cool looking, and of course they're very reliable. Before we dive into the data sheet, I'd just like to point out uh, an image for you, a photograph of a typical or a more traditional rotary switch. This is what they generally look like, and they're generally multi-position. There would be one lug underneath that would be the common, and then as you rotate the shaft, it would select which one of these lugs here the output would go to. And that would be very common or very typical of a rotary switch. Now there can be uh, multi-layers to these. In old equipment you might see one, two, three, four layers of these uh, lug areas and that would allow for you to switch many, many uh, devices with uh, the rotary switch. So these can become very elaborate. 
uh, but nonetheless they are handy in certain situations. I myself would like to see them come back into favor and replace some of the more modern uh, equivalents. Uh, they're just not as intuitive or user-friendly. Now let's take a look at the data sheet. Uh, this is one uh, not of, of the one that we're using here on the, on the breadboard, but it's a good comparative for us to look at. Like all switches, we want to check the switch rating. 1 amp, 24 volts, AC or DC. We're well within that. Life cycle is greater than 10,000 cycles. Uh, that should be fine. Uh, here's just another note. Uh, features, maximum of 12 positions and up to four poles per switch. And that gets back to what I was mentioning here, where you could have multiple layers of these plates to give you more output or more control. Uh, like all others, you've got all the different uh, configurations mechanically, etc. And this is showing you uh, the number, you got 12 way, 6 way, 4 way. Uh, 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 for different numbers of poles and uh, connections that it can handle. Uh, then, like most switches, again, here's that master decoder badge to give you all the different options available for this type of switch. Switching is quite interesting and you often have to have this many options to address the market's needs. Now let's take a look at wiring. and In this case we're going to show you the wiring for a more traditional rotary switch. But let's start over here at the Pi Pico. Here's our 3.3 volt line out. We're going to bring that down, loop it around and come over to the positive voltage rail on the breadboard. I always throw in a ground reel just to keep it handy if I want to do further experimentations. Otherwise this ground wire is not used. Uh, following our 3.3 volts back through the ground rail, it's going to go up to the common on the rotary switch. From here, depending on where you've rotated the switch, one of these would be active. In other words, it would connect from the common to either this one or this one, or this one, etc. And then you would wire that. Uh, for our example that we're mimicking, we've only got a on and an off, so ours will go into pin 15. But if you had multiple positions, you could wire them in to each of the different GP pins along the way. Moving over to the actual breadboard with our rotary switch, we can see that here's our 3.3 volt output from the Pico into the positive rail. Through our yellow wire, we're providing current to the switch, but the current does not pass through the switch till it's turned on, comes out the blue wire and into GP number 15. Now let's see how we handle that in code. In code, it's quite simple. Um, we're going to import our machine library, which gives us access to the physical hardware of the Pi Pico. We're also going to import the, the MicroTime time library so that we can provide uh, perform a dwell within our main loop to slow things down. We're going to utilize the onboard LED, which is located in this area on the Pi Pico. That'll show us the state of our rotary switch. So we'll create an object called LED from machine.pin and that is pin number 25 for the onboard LED. We're going to configure that as an output so that we can turn the LED on and off with that output. We're going to create another object for our actual switch and we're going to very creatively call that rotary switch. If you've got multiple positions you would have rotary switch underscore one underscore two three and you'd use different GP pins along the way. So here we've just got one, so it's rotary switch equals machine.pin. We're using pin number 15. We're going to configure that pin as an input, and then we're going to pull that switch value down to zero volts uh, when it's not uh, turned on. And that minimizes uh, false positives, etc. We're using a polling method uh, to compare uh, to handle, to compare and handle the, the on-off of the switch. 
Uh, I always typically print ready, set, go at the start of my endless loop or my main loop, uh, which is very traditional in MicroPython, not the ready, set, go, but to have a main loop. Um, here's how we would uh, perform the actions of checking the state if rotary switch dot value equals true, meaning it was one, then GP15 is high. We would turn on the LED and print on. Likewise, if the rotary switch is off and we needed to perform an action based on that, the statement LF rotary switch value equals false, meaning GP15 is low, then we'll print off and turn the LED off. And then we go into our sleep. Let's go ahead and run it and see what it looks like. Here we're seeing off on the screen. We rotate the switch to the on position. We see the LED come on. And on the screen we see it's printing on. Turn the switch off. On screen goes to off and our LED goes off. And of course, it's truly that simple. It's nothing more than an on or off switch, and it is a mechanical rotary switch. I believe that'll wrap up our discussion about using the rotary switches uh, with a Raspberry Pi Pico using MicroPython. As with most of the videos in this series, we have files that you can download, which would include uh, the fr fritzing diagram, and source code, uh, perhaps some other information uh, as needed. You can download that from our companion website, makingstuffwithchrisdayhut.com. Links are provided in the description below. I'd also like to mention that there's probably about 50 or 60 total videos planned for this series on the Raspberry Pi Pico and interfacing it using it uh, with a variety of devices. You can find more information about the full series on our companion website with links to each of the videos and a, a complete description. I'd like to express my thanks. I really do appreciate you spending time watching the video with me today. Uh, hopefully you found it informative or entertaining. Um, if so, I would hope that you'll subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. It costs you nothing, so it's uh, certainly very good value. Uh, if you like the video, please click the like button and uh, there's this notification bell somewhere in that same area that allows you to be notified whenever I publish a new video. So that can be kind of handy if you're following along, especially with this video series on the Raspberry Pi Pico. With that, I hope to see you in the next video.